You're listening to the Revision Path Podcast, a weekly showcase of the world's black graphic designers, web designers, and web developers. Through in-depth interviews, you'll learn about their work, their goals, and what inspires them as creative individuals. Here's your host, Maurice Cherry. Welcome again to the Revision Path Podcast. I'm Maurice Cherry, and I've got a great interview coming up for you, but first, let's talk about our sponsors. First up, MailChimp. MailChimp has over 7 million users, and they send over 10 billion emails each month. As a matter of fact, I just sent an email before this podcast using MailChimp. It's probably in your inbox right now if you've signed up for it on the website. MailChimp makes sending email fast and easy, and best of all, it's free to sign up. Just head on over to MailChimp.com and try it today. Next up is our new sponsor, Hover. Hover is the best way to buy and manage domain names. I've used it for years, and now I want you to try out Hover as well. They take all the hassle and friction out of registering a domain. It couldn't be easier. And I've got a special promo code here for you, too. Save 10% off your first purchase by using the promo code 50EPISODES. That's five zero episodes, all one word. Now, that code expires at the end of November, so you might want to go ahead and hop on that. Tell them a vision path sent you. I'm also conducting a survey through the end of this year. I want to learn more about you, how you found out about the show, and other information like that. That's the kind of stuff I need to really build and grow Revision Path and turn it into something that can stick around for years to come. So your input is super important. To take the survey, go to revisionpath.com forward slash survey. Now, I will admit it's a long survey. It's about 15 to 20 minutes tops, but... Every person who takes the survey is eligible to win a $100 Amazon.com gift card. And I just gave away a $50 Amazon.com gift card last year, so there's no BS here. I'm really dying for your feedback, so don't be shy. The more info you can provide, the better. Now on to the show. This week, I talked with UX designer Rashida White. Uh, I talked about her work with General Assembly, DJing, and the connection between music and tech, and vegan ice cream. And the key to ice cream is the fat. So if you know the proper proportions of the specific nut milks to have or the, or the dairy alternatives to utilize, and that creamery is easy to kind of grasp, which is why I use three different types. And you really can't tell. The best part is just to tell people that I made ice cream and haven't tasted it. And then you tell them it's vegan. And then you tell them it's soy free. And then you watch their mouths drop. So it's, it's pretty funny. This is Revision Path. Let's start the show. All right, so tell us who you are and what you do. My name is Rashida White, and I'm currently a user experience practitioner, an educator, and a teaching artist. Tell us a little bit about user experience. What is that, and why is it something that's important for designers and for developers? UX, user experience, is more of an umbrella term, and it's actually kind of difficult to define because it means different things to different people, but it can be things like the design process, what the end result is or the actual experience that users will have, but basically it's all of those things. So mm-hmm. it could be field research, face-to-face interviewing, graphic design, usability, prototyping, interface layout, visual design, copywriting, content strategy, prototyping. But yeah, it's really just making sure that whatever it is you're designing or building has the end user in mind. How did you first get into it? I stumbled on uh, UX because I majored in psychology and I really love behavior and I really love to see how people interacted with um, devices. I started working at Apple as a creative and I taught a lot of um, less, like software lessons to various people from all ages, all backgrounds. And it was interesting to see that when Apple would come out with a new update or a new interface design or a new software, how people would interact with that and what was visible to certain people and why. From there... My friend ran a small boutique and hired me as her assistant, but then kind of saw that my psychology background helped with things like stakeholder interviews or doing information architecture and usability testing. So I I I jumped on board on that in 2012 and have uh, finished up that learning, I would say. Well, I'm always learning, but I took an immersive course at General Assembly, and I've been um, here since the spring. 
so talk to me a little bit about General Assembly. I know that there are a bunch of different locations. There's one that just opened up here in Atlanta, I think about a, a few months ago, because I get emails about courses and things. But what is General Assembly? Is it like a co-working space? Is it a school? What is that exactly? Uh, GA, General Assembly, it started off as a co-working space, but really they saw, they found the need um, in the tech industry and tech education and started transforming a space to kind of transform thinkers into creators. And so from that, they run immersive programs that can either be 10 weeks or 12 weeks, either in years of experience design, web development. Uh, we've re- recently launched product management and a part-time data science course. But I would just call it either like a trade school or a professional studies space for tech. And you're a designer in residence there, is that right? Yeah, designer in residence or commonly known as a junior instructor, but I pretty much teach UX. I also am a liaison between the students, the instructors, as well as the um, liaison between the students and the program coordinator, program coordinator to the, uh, the lead instructor. So I'm kind of this hybrid position of a designer leading and mentoring the students, teaching them about UX and kind of just managing the classroom. What are some other projects and things that you're associated with? I also, you know, I work at GA as a designer in resident, but I also work for Copeland and Propatty Partners. And we are, I would say, a small user experience boutique as well, but we are a social uh, nonprofit. And we mentor kids ages 18 to 26, and we turn our client work into integrated curriculum. So we're starting to run six month programs with about 10 students where we teach them user experience product management slash entrepreneurship and front-end web development. So I am the director of community outreach and partnerships at Copeland and Patty Partners, and I also work for Willing a Rock Camp as a teaching artist and digital media advisor. Um, so I teach girls about songwriting, DJ lessons, and anything that kind of involves like music and tech. Oh, DJing. Nice, nice. With the, the music and tech, what's what's that about? I know I feel like that using a technology at least maybe within the past five to seven years has gotten a really closer relationship, especially in terms of uh, terminology and jargon, like you talk about mashups and things like that. Yeah, the relationship between music and tech is growing because our technological understanding as humans is increasing vastly. So I remember DJing and, and how special it was to actually go to a record store and find albums and digging crates and getting your fingers dusty and mm-hmm. trying to kind of like curate your sound is now with like you being able to like DJ from a laptop with a trackpad, not needing any external devices. It's kind of now easily accessible. So I think accessibility is kind of why there's been this rampantness in the correlation between music and technology. Um, but yeah, mashups, you know, two different songs, mashing together, remixes. I love all those things. Yeah. How did you first get started with DJ? I used to make mixtapes and would Upon new friendships or new love interests, I would always bust out, you know, the songs I was listening to and either put them on a CD or a tape. But my friend saw how much time and, and passion I spent curating these uh, sounds that she bought me turntables when I was like, I don't know, 18 or maybe 20, 2000. Yeah, 18 or 19. Um, so I've been DJing since then. So it's been about 13 years. Oh, nice. You do a lot of mentoring with with children, like you said, with the camp and things like that, as well as sort of your mentoring and teaching through General Assembly. Have you had any mentors that have really helped you out in your your path to where you are now? Recently, there's been a lot of people popping up in my life that have been missing, I would say, from my past years. One recently is D'Angela Duff, who is currently the co-director and industry associate for the IDM program at NYU Polytech and School of Engineering. Mm -hmm. She's just an amazing woman. She's a designer, photographer, and web developer and has been around in tech for a while. And just her insight and her attentiveness and her empathy, just I immediately connected with her. And so she's someone that I'm constantly emailing back and forth regarding where I'm going and, and, you know, kind of seeking that guidance about what I should be doing and keeping my head on straight, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And Dominic Kropati, who was actually my user experience teacher at General Assembly, who I now co-teach with and I'm a part of this partnership He's also um, someone who is amazing, just was a jazz musician, is now someone who has a strong and firm understanding of design and really wants to kind of revolutionize the way everyone interacts with the world. And so our passions align in that respect. So he's someone who I'm constantly consulting and constantly being challenged by as well. So, What would you say has been the biggest, I guess, asset to your success? I think the biggest asset uh, to my success is understanding that 
I'm not on this earth alone, as, as cheesy as that may sound. And I don't really feel like I'm doing my job if I'm not finding a way to better people. So I often will sit, tell people that it's not so much what I'm doing regarding what my business is. I would say that my business is actually the people business. So really I'm just figuring out a way to better myself and, and be better to people and be a stronger example for the youth that I never necessarily had. I think that's kind of what drives me. What advice would you give to someone that's just kind of starting out in this field? Let's say in, in user experience, we'll say that. I think the most important thing to do is find something in your environment that's broken and fix it. I used to think that I was a complainer and just complained about everything. And I realized that I just wanted to make things better, make things function better. So anyone who's interested in UX, I think it's important to look at it as a philosophy, not as a job mm-hmm. title. Apply it to everything. Like UX everything. UX your relationships. UX like... <laughs> your environment, um, find a way to make things better and and build something and build something that's going to change everyone or even just make something better and simpler for you or your small community. Um, And seek out groups online, like look up on meetup.com or Eventbrite or even Twitter. If you just type in UX group, wherever you are in location, you'll find some group somewhere uniting (laughs) to redesign things and make things better. So I want to go back and talk more about General Assembly and kind of try to tie this into a larger maybe conversation about education technology. Now, I know when I started out on the web, and this was maybe like the mid-90s, early 2000s, there were no co-working spaces. There were no you know online courses. There certainly weren't any degree-granting programs that have to do with sort of the disciplines that we now use pretty much every day in, in this industry, like user experience, web design, et cetera. Mm-hmm. And it, it feels like places like General Assembly are kind of turning the tide with that. Do you think that now more people that are coming into this industry are looking towards those types of educational avenues, or is it still trying to find a more traditional kind of brick-and-mortar, four-year degree type institution? It's interesting that you would say that because this is the second time that I am helping teach Um, a class, and it's an equal split. You have people that are coming from traditional outlets of schooling, and then you have those that are coming from a non-traditional approach. So I think that places like GA provide, unfortunately, a more current representation of the technology industry, whereas when you're dealing with traditional schooling, I feel like the curriculum is so tight that it's hard to change, pivot where technology is going. And so depending on the person and what's okay with them and where they want to go and the type of names that they want to be able to drop. It's, it's really one of those things where it's just, it's situational. It all depends. Yeah. I I know exactly how that is. I taught for DeVry university for a few years and it took probably about a year for me to get them to change because the way that they had the course and everything laid out when they were talking about doing page layouts Mm -hmm. in HTML, they talked about using tables. Yeah. And this was maybe like 2010. So it took about a year for me to say, you know, we really don't use tables for page layout anymore. We use CSS. We shouldn't be teaching these students these antiquated models of (laughs) how to lay out pages because then they're going to go work somewhere and they're going to get embarrassed because they know, like, these old methods of doing things. Yeah. And it took a year. It took a whole year. I think I taught six courses before it was changed. And I would always have to kind of rebel against that and say, well, I know the book says this, Mm -hmm. but this is how we do it out in the real world. This is how we do designs and stuff. So I definitely see that that learning curve is is sort of smoothed out a bit in terms of when you're working at and learning from these types of places, Mm -hmm. you're getting more current knowledge that people are using in the field today. Yeah, I I just I just feel like it's. It's easy for a lot of people to seek out additional courses. So, yeah, you, you graduated or, yeah, you're in a position at work, but then something might encourage you to take, like, a night class to get a better understanding of, of something. So I just feel like GA provides multiple options of staying abreast with the current technology trends and the kind of need-to-knows uh, regarding the industry and, and the direction it's pivoting in. So, uh, But, yeah, I definitely get the positioning of having to feel a certain way about teaching something that's outdated but knowing that it's important. And understanding that, but, again, being able to deliver with what's current. Right. Yeah. And with that, I would say, and I guess I'm asking this as well, like, are companies also looking more towards 
the skills or are they looking more towards where you got the skills from? Well, I know with designers, everything is about your portfolio piece and what you've worked on. Um, So I think if a company is aware of GA and the alternative services that are popping up to learn design and learn web development, then I, I don't think it really matters where you've been schooled from. But I can see that for non-traditional places or rather traditional places that like the leverage of names, I can see how that might kind of deter them from hiring a student or not. But our success rate and our hire rate is, is in the 90s specifically for user experience design. So I can only speak to that aspect of the program that I'm representing. But in regards to, you know, what that looks like to people who are hiring, it, it, I think it just depends on, on their knowledge of the program and whether or not a name is more important than someone's portfolio pieces of their work and their process. Yeah, USA Today had this article that was talking about how minorities have d- degrees. They're talking about tech jobs. Minorities have degrees, but they don't get hired. And so it sort of flies in the face of a lot of this talk about diversity in the tech fields with relation to the shortage of, say, you know, blacks and Hispanics. Mm-hmm. And I think they're mostly talking about in in Silicon Valley. Mm-hmm. So basically the findings kind of go against these claims, like saying that doesn't hold water. Like clearly you have these people that have the degrees, but why are they not getting hired? So it's like some, it's clearly there has to be some sort of bias somewhere that's preventing this from happening. And the reason that I asked about the, uh, about if it matters kind of where you went is because I know that there are some places, I know there's places I've interviewed where I may have the experience and the portfolio, but they've not heard of, you know, where I might have learned it from. So they don't think that it's real. I'm, do, I'm using air quotes here, but you know what I mean? Like they don't think that it's it's viable yeah. because it's something that kind of just popped up maybe a few years ago or something like that. Well, not only that, it allows them to kind of nitpick at you as well as yeah. kind of like uphold standards that support like a systematic infrastructure of bias. Like I could talk about that for hours, but to, to put it nicely, one of the things recently that I read is is the gentleman who... I believe his name was Jose, let's say, and he applied to these jobs. He didn't hear back. And as soon as he removed the S and the accent over his E and changed his name to Joe, the same places he applied for with the exact same resume called him back. And the only thing that was different was his name. So I think oh, wow. the more that we as POCs, people of color, minorities, underrepresented in specific spaces in um, work, specifically tech, I think it's really about not questioning who you are and not being upset that that specific employer didn't hire you because if they're willing to sit here and nitpick that they don't understand the program you're from or are questioning your skill sets because of like your background, it's like, do you really want to be in that type of work environment anyways? So yeah. I think the more that we as people network and allow others to see that we are individuals um, within a, a larger entity and kind of sell ourselves and our self value, then eventually that you will just be known for who you are and not what people can group you a part of negatively. Do you do a lot of networking? I do actually. I'm a, I'm a smiley face introvert, if that makes sense. <laughs> I often come across as an extrovert, but I'm actually an introvert and no, I mean, I'm definitely easy to talk to. Sometimes I don't smile. So I can see I can smile or hard harder approach, but I'm definitely someone who, who, you know, networks my ass off, so to speak. <laughs> What do you, would you say is probably the most important thing that you've learned from all the work that you've done? I think the most important thing from all the work that I've done is finding the passion within it and remembering why you're doing it. I work six days a week, and the seventh day is, is literally think like still work because I'm, I'm prepping for the following week. And the amount of work that I do to help other people, I know, <laughs> is, is going to change things. So it's, it's kind of more so staying true to myself and true to my mission, and just accepting that things will come when they come. So working six days a week, how do you get your creativity back if maybe you're feeling uninspired or burned out? I like to just sit in silence and remember things that make me happy. So I think about like my relationship, or I think about music, um, music specifically, and I think about music will jog my memory. I'm, I'm currently working with Dominic and a, a short crew with this product called RG Beats, RGB Beats rather, and literally it's a new musical interface for drummers that's going to change the game of drumming and how we interact with drumming tools. So 
finding a way to connect my work with my passions is kind of like how I keep going. I'm, I'm constantly working on music incentives or expressive arts therapy tools um, and using technology to kind of bridge that um, as a way for people to kind of feel better about themselves and their environments and, and just making sure that the work that I do stands true and holds true to who I am. So in that sense, not selling out, you know, mm-hmm. or not giving so much of your time to something that's not going to come back or you're going to get credit for. So I just make sure that what I'm doing is something that I'm proud of and something I can easily talk about. Right, right. Now, in June of of this year, you were at the White House for the LGBT Innovation Summit. Is that correct? Yes. Tell me a little bit about sort of what that event was, uh, what, what did you learn from it, and also, I guess, what are kind of the next steps from that event? Will the... Does the White House plan on holding another one the next year? You know, that kind of thing. I have no idea if they plan on holding one. I know the first one was successful. It was the inaugural um, of that moment. But it literally was, it felt as if, to me, I went to the White House. I didn't know what to expect. I ran into friends that I hadn't seen since, like, 2008. And I'm seeing all these different people from these different backgrounds, from the LGBTQ the community and it was just amazing to see everyone in tech everyone out everyone proud and everyone really working to kind of change the game of like how we as lgbtq navigate this world safely so it was nice to see the the key speakers that were there it was nice to hear people's elevator pitches for the products they're working on most importantly it was nice to network with other people in tech that may be able to connect you with someone to further your mission or be a direct connect for you so, yeah, it was, it was awesome. Were there other people there from New York as well? Yeah, the, the crew from New York, we were actually selected by Out in Tech. So um, okay. Out in Tech is a tech meetup for people who are out in tech in New York City, and they selected 15 people out of 200 to represent them at the White House. So, oh, wow. um, yeah, they, we, they had a supply and kind of talk about what we're currently doing in the community and what we're working on. And someone who comes from intimate partner violence background I am really advocating and striving for a strong representation of privacy and digital mm-hmm. spaces. So I wrote about my work in that as well as my work in the community with youth and being a part of Anti-Violence Project, uh, representing them on their Speakers Bureau, which is talking about intimate partner violence. I guess that's kind of what flagged the, their attention to send me specifically there. So with the... Wa- so, oh, yeah. <laughs> no, no, no. Go ahead. Go ahead. So with the White House... Regarding next steps, they have an in-house design team called 18F, and they're really cool. Uh, Hillary Hartley is the creative director for that, and her and I have been in, in email contacts just regarding like what 18F does and seeing if what I'm trying to do regarding privatizing digital spaces and social networking spaces is something that you know, they could help me out with. And so we've just been trying to figure out what to do with that and how to go about making that happen. So what is the tech scene like in New York? I know I've spoken with a lot of people from New York, and everyone kind of gives me a little bit of a different answer. <laughs> it's so different. I think the impersonality of the city makes the tech scene a little different, and that's because as the way we commute and the way we kind of group together as New Yorkers, like you're always on foot, you're always on the subway, on the Metro North, on a train or a bus, and just the heavy amount of, of exposure we have to each other, you need to run into someone who does the exact same thing you do. So I know in California, there's like Silicon Beach, which is in like the area, there's Silicon uh, Valley, but the strip we work on, which is kind of like Gramercy area, Flatiron District, we call it the Silicon Alley. Um, and so pretty much a lot of the startups are within this like seven block radius of one another. But it, the tech scene is just really diverse, really creative, and has a lot of room for opportunity and growth. Who has offered you some of the most useful career advice, and what was that advice? Deanne LaDuff, again. Okay. <laughs> yeah, there's just this constant need, as, as women of color specifically, to kind of need to, I don't know, kind of be small in specific spaces because of how we are perceived socially. Uh, mm-hmm. And so I, what I've been combating or trying to combat is kind of just not being defeated by certain work environments or certain interactions and hearing her story, just, you know, what she experienced in the nineties with techs and the the two thousands, just, she's just a very inspiring woman. And so she just kind of keeps me level-headed with that and kind of keeps that light at the tunnel burning for me and constantly reminding me to like stay true to myself. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Another thing that goes in my head is the words of my mother, which I've kind of grouped into an acronym called GOY, G-O-Y, which is get over yourself. 
<laughs> so me also getting over my ego and um, how I think things should be and kind of just going with the flow and accepting things as they are. Mm-hmm. So it's, yeah, it's, it's just, you know, my mom, D'Angelo's played a part, Dom's played a part, Dana Carwas from NYU gave me some really good information. And yeah, I mean, the basic message is kind of staying true to yourself. And as long as you're doing something that's going to benefit the good of the people, then you're not doing anything wrong. Right. Yeah. Would you say that you're satisfied creatively? I definitely am. I, I'm not creating as much music as I would like to, but I am involved in a couple of creative adventures in music, so that's kind of keeping me sane and level-headed. Speaking of music, who are you listening to? <laughs> <laughs> that huge question. For me, that, that's a whole other half-an-hour conversation. My friend, DJ Mia Moore from L.A., her and I have been doing this music exchange, and so she recently hit me to this artist called Sango, so I'm listening to a lot of Sango right now, listening to uh, James Blake, uh, Mr. Lies, Jordan Rakai, or Rocky, can't say the last name, it's R-A-K-E-I, Amon Omari, um, producer, songwriter, cat from L.A., love him, just reminiscent of like old Dwelle, but kind of like a mix of Dilla, so you get that like soulful voice but with these really, really mm-hmm. good beats, um, and I, I really love Amon Omari a lot. Yeah, SZA. Kalela, love Kalela, and then Kendrick Lamar, just lyrically, he's just disgusting. <laughs> he's so <laughs> sick to me, and like the content, even though it could be considered the same content that's displayed across hip-hop on the radio, his cadence and his ability to tell stories to me is something that reminds me, is like really reminiscent of like 90s hip-hop, so he's constantly in the iPod, so to speak. Yeah. <laughs> Is there anything in particular that you regret not doing, like due to fear or any other emotion? I regret not allowing myself to kind of progress musically and and, and keeping up with my crafts out of the need to kind of make ends meet and keep a roof over my head. So I I let a lot of creative ventures go regarding bands and DJing and not really pushing through the difficult times and, and making the decision between art and work (laughs) so the artist life or the typical nine to five so i think not being more disciplined with myself keeping up my craft something that i definitely regret if you could have one do-over would that be it would you want to try to see what the other path looks like if you pursue them the music musician route if i actually had one do-over it would be when i was five years old okay (laughs) i know it sounds funny but i used to dance around a lot dance and sing and i grew up in kind of like a musical entertainment industry family and so I remember when my mom stuck me in one of Debbie Allen's dance classes and I remember when we started class I just I wouldn't move I just stood there like just stood there and so um, (laughs) when I finally was able to gather my words it was like I told her that it wasn't fun and I realized that the competition that is often grouped with creative like creative expression as a child I, I saw that and it kind of like turned me off really because I felt that like my individual artistic expression is now being judged in its group, which made no sense because I'm an individual. So it's kind of, I, I have this back and forth thing that has stuck with me and kind of haunted me in a lot of uh, creative ventures and opportunities that I've had. And so I think the reason why I work as actively as I do in like the music scene for um, the youth in New York is to teach them not to compare themselves to other people as well as not to treat art like a competitive space and as long, again, as you're just doing you, someone out there is going to support and, and vibe with you and, and want to align with you. And, you know, you'll attract the right people. So I wish I had me, <laughs> my older self as a, as a child, in that moment to kind of help me, help me push through my social anxiety and my fear of being judged. Now, I hear that you make vegan ice cream. Is that right? I do. Yeah, I do. <laughs> Please tell me about the vegan ice cream. I'm lactose intolerant, as most people are in the world. And yeah, I took a year off to take care of my mother. And with that, my friend runs what's called Alchemy Creamery. And he used to just make experiences at his house. And we would sit there and I would taste test and I would play video games. And I started helping him out in his kitchen. And then when I got busy, just to have ice cream at home and to give to like, you know, my, my partner's uh, mom and aunt and whatnot, I would just make ice cream for them as a gift and just as a healthy alternative in the house because I'm obsessed with ice cream. So I started playing with flavors. I was gifted an ice cream maker. And since I have an ice cream maker, it just has not 
stopped rotating. <laughs> is it like soy milk ice cream, rice milk, almond milk? It's actually soy free. So I'm allergic okay. to soy. So the hemp I, uh, I'm sorry, the hemp, the milk I often use rather is either hemp milk, coconut milk, hazelnut milk, or almond milk. It just depends on the flavor. But the fattier nut milks uh, that are not soy is kind of what I migrate towards. Okay. Yeah, I'm lactose intolerant too, and I, I've had some of those. I think it's so delicious. That's the brand that does the, uh, the coconut milk ice cream. Yeah. It's pretty good. I, I, I mean, I think it's kind of a mind over matter thing because initially I taste it, and I'm expecting that kind of ice creaminess that comes with it. And it's a little. I don't know. For me, it's a little flat. Like, mm, like I can eat it if I don't think about it. I'm like, okay, this is ice cream. I'm num num num. Yeah. Num. But if I don't think, <laughs> if I think about it, I'm like, yeah, it doesn't really taste exactly like ice cream. But yeah. <laughs> but no, that's a really neat hobby to have that you kind of do that on the side. Are you thinking about maybe turning that into a business, or will you still just sort of keep it as a, a downtime sort of thing? I think I'm gonna keep it as a downtime sort of thing, especially too, because I I try to be as involved in my friend's vegan ice cream company as much as possible. So I don't want to be a direct competitor. So I'm definitely supportive of that, but. <laughs> Something my mother, my grandmother, my father's side used to do is make homemade ice cream. So it's kind of something that I want to gift to my children, so to speak, and continue to do because you hit it on the nail. Yeah, you have these alternatives that are in the market, like soy delicious or, or cocoa delicious, but they taste mostly like water and sugar. And they have a lot. Of yeah. Sugar, um, but the, it's like it's like eating cereal with water instead of milk. Yeah. That's what it tastes like. But the key to making ice cream and the key to ice cream is the fat. So if you know the proper proportions of the specific nut milks to have or the, or the dairy alternatives to utilize. And that creamery is easy to kind of grasp, which is why I use three different types. And you really can't tell. The best part is just to tell people that I made ice cream and have them taste it. And then you tell them it's vegan. And then you tell them it's soy free. And then you watch their mouths drop. So it's, it's pretty funny seeing that. Yeah. If you had to live somewhere else, where would you live? <laughs> I want to go back to Cali. But if I could have it my way, I would have... The environment of Seattle, the trees and the houses, with um, the beach access of Malibu, but the grime of New York. <laughs> so, kind of a hard question to ask because there's there's really really awesome spots around the world, but all in one, I don't know. It's either gonna have to be Southern California or just New York for me. Is there anything in particular that you're excited about at the moment? I'm excited about um, what's happening with RG Beats. I'm also planning a sound hackathon with Willie Mae Rock Camp Hive and Lower East Side Girls that's happening in November. So I'm, I'm really dope. I'm really like jazzed about that. We had a meeting and kind of a, like put some official dates in and activities in. So I'm looking forward to that in November. We'll be running a like a five hour hackathon for sound and the girls will learn things like Arduinos and different like DJ software. So like Push and Ableton, they'll have exposure to like Pro Tools and messing with like soundboard and yeah, it's, it's going to be really awesome. So I'm excited about those two things. And so I'm kind of excited to get the ball rolling on this idea or concept that I have in my head about making social media space, uh, spaces safer. So mm-hmm. I want to figure out a way of kind of aggregating certain content and, and certain behaviors away from social media feeds. And I find that no matter who you're speaking to, regardless of um, just, you know, despite their background, there's this like insistent need to kind of separate themselves anytime a, a relationship has failed, whether that be romantic, platonic, whatever. There tends to be this need to kind of break up with social media. So how do we keep people engaged with social media, but also kind of not force them to interact with things that are kind of like toxic and not really conducive to their healing process. So I'm trying to figure out a way of aggregating specific content away since privacy settings within certain social media infrastructures like lack that. Um, So just, yeah, you know, once I have all these client projects finished, I'd like to kind of start focusing on that more. I think if there's some kind of way that you can tie that into safety of some sort, like safety of people online with, and I guess I'm thinking primarily about this whole quote unquote gamer gate issue yeah. uh, where women are really being targeted online with all kinds of threats and just nasty messages and things like that. Yeah. Is this kind of like along the lines of what you're talking about? It's along the lines of that. It's, 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 yeah. it's in response to, it's really in response to breaking up with someone and having this algorithm on the back end 
shoot you information that reminds right. you that you're not connected to them. Or for some reason, the one person in your Facebook feed who you haven't spoken to, you know, is getting a comment from that one person. You know what I mean? Or just trying to figure out a way to kind of like delete trolls, <laughs> so yeah, to sure. speak, or even the need, for example, the, the pushback with the transgender community and wanting to use real names, like not understanding how detriment our lives are as, you know, people of color or people who are, are in the LGBTQ like spectrum, like how to kind of like combat that. And it just comes from those types of needs. And despite who you are, it's like, sometimes you just don't want to be connected to people. You don't want to be reminded that you're connected to them. You want absolutely nothing to do with them. And unfortunately, because there aren't the privacy set settings intact, it's like, it makes sense to figure out a way of aggregating that content away. So yeah, it's, it's in response to that. It's in response to anyone who's ever felt safe, unsafe online. It's in response to anyone who's ever felt that they could basically be all up in your business. <laughs> you know, it's, it's kind of like, I don't know. I want to solve that problem. I just do. <laughs> where, where do you see yourself in the next five years or so? You think you'd be working on that? Yeah, definitely. It's something that I, I've been speaking to a lot of people about, and I'm slowly getting that team together. And so hopefully by February, I can start actually building it. Oh, cool. So just to kind of wrap things up, where can our audience find out more about you online? Uh, www.rashida w h i t e dot com w w dot com <laughs> or on twitter at r a s h i d a l w h i t e at rashida l white yeah twitter at my website all right sounds good rashida white thank you again so much for taking time out of your day just explaining to us about user experience talking with us about the work that you're doing and where your path is going to take you. I think that this was a really good conversation. So thank you. Thank you, Maurice. That's it for this week. Thanks to Rashida White for our great conversation. And of course, thanks to you for tuning in. You can find out more about Rashida's work at RashidaWhite.com. Uh, there are also more links in the show notes over at revisionpath.com. Of course, much thanks to our lovely sponsors, MailChimp and Hover. MailChimp has you covered when it comes to emails, and it's perfect for entrepreneurs and small businesses. Sign up for a free account today at MailChimp.com. Hover makes registering and managing domain names super easy. When you've got a great idea and you want to secure a domain name for it, Hover's got you covered. Actually, that's a really good slogan if they decide to use that. Hover's got you covered. Anyway, um, for me, my big idea came in the shower this morning. Roughmercenary.com. I have no idea what I'm going to do with it, but I know that Hover's going to keep it safe when I'm ready for it. Save 10% off your first purchase by using the promo code 50 episodes. Now, this episode was edited by RJ Basilio and mixed by yours truly. Our intro is by the talented music man Dre with intro audio by Yellow Speaker. The outro audio, titled They See Me Growing, is courtesy of Jimmy Square. Can you see us growing? Make sure you subscribe to us on iTunes, Stitcher Radio, and SoundCloud. Leave a rating and a review, it really means a lot. Revision Path is a 318 media project. If you like the work we're doing with the podcast and the website, then visit revisionpath.com forward slash donate and let us know. Leave a tip in our tip jar, sponsor an upcoming episode, or join at the $5 fist bump level and show your ongoing support. Thanks so much for listening, and we'll see you next time.